Hi everyone, Brandon here with FastDataScience.ai and welcome to another episode of This Week in AI. If this is your first time watching this show, this is the show where I bring you three news articles that I've read that have hit the news wire this week related to data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. And although today's theme is lessons from, from LOAB, we're really gonna talk about articles that deal with safety, quality, and weirdness. What I try and do is give you a little bit of a sense of what the article's all about, talk a little bit about how I think the data science works in the article, and then hopefully inspire some of your own ideas, maybe even engage in a conversation or two that helps us find new solutions for related problems where we can use data science as a superpower. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump in to this week's first article, and it really does have to do with safety. The first article that I read that I found super interesting this week was to clear deadly landmines, science turns to drones and machine learning. So it turns out there's still quite a, a bit of geographic area in the United States and in the world where there are active drone or active landmines, excuse me, that are buried in those geographic regions. And every once in a while, an unsuspecting citizen might be walking across that land and accidentally step on one of those active landmines and blow up. So obviously, there's a huge safety concern here. And it's a pretty big problem because it turns out that when wars end, landmines don't just automatically turn off. So there's a lot of landmines that are out there that are still active that represent a huge safety concern for a lot of people. So in this particular article, there's a company that's attempting to solve this problem through the use of drone technology and machine learning. So here's how I think the data science could work in this particular context. There's a couple of different ways you could solve this problem, but the first might be obviously set the drones up with some cameras to fly them over different geographic regions where landmines have been known to have been planted. The second thing you might do is either embed chips that allow for lightweight computer vision models to score images in real time as the drone flies over those geographic regions and try to identify areas in those regions that may represent signals suggesting possible, possible active landmines. Another way in which you could solve the problem is you could have those images passed to another server somewhere else off site where additional machine learning models with maybe a little bit more power and maybe also that are able to pick up on additional energies coming from those landmines, which I don't even know if that's a thing, maybe it is, that they could use all of that data together to be even more precise in trying to identify where those landmines may exist in those geographic spaces so they can get some people to go remove them and hopefully save a lot more lives. Pretty cool. All right, let's jump on to the next article. The second article has to do with quality and quality in a particular field that is near and dear to my heart. So I used to be an academic. I was an assistant professor at a university many, many, many years ago, a whole nother life ago, it feels like it sometimes. But in academia, it turns out that we really like to publish our research. And publishing research is really important, and it's even more important to publish high quality research. And we have a belief in academia that certain peer reviewed journals are higher quality than other peer reviewed journals. So in this particular research article, these researchers actually asked that question. Do higher quality journals also have higher quality reviewers? So here's how I think the data science works in this context. The researchers took a sample of 10,000 reviewer comments from diff different peer reviewed journals. They then used natural language processing to extract information from those 10,000 examples of reviewer comments to create indexes, indexes that might indicate quality. That is, that some reviewer comments could be higher or lower on certain quality metrics. These researchers then went about 
correlating their quality metrics with the actual impact score of the journal. An impact score, really briefly, is just a way in which academics try and articulate and provide a metric around how high quality a particular journal is. Well, what these researchers found was that, yes, indeed, there is a correlation between the quality indices they created from their NLP and the impact score of those journals. Here's the caveat. The correlation was actually really quite small. They don't actually report in this particular research article how small, but they do say that there's a tremendous amount of variability. So if you were to look at the scatter plot, so to speak, of the quality metric against the impact score, you might see a lot of random dots. In other words, dots that don't form a nice neat line suggesting higher quality, higher impact. This means that there is still a lot of work to be done in academia for us to improve the quality of the review process. But at the end of the day, it shows how we can use natural language processing and data science to help assess quality across lots of different domains. All right, let's jump in to the last article and the article that really does represent the theme of the show, Lessons from Loeb. So if you haven't already heard, there's a Twitter storm happening around this character that they are calling Loeb. And the title of the article is Meet Loeb. And I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Maybe it's Loab. I don't know. But I'm going to call whatever this thing is Loeb. It is the AI art generated demon currently haunting the internet. So I read this article just purely because I was interested in understanding why we care about some creepy looking picture generated by some AI generation system. I mean, we've all heard lots of news articles about Dolly and how you can type things like semantic descriptions and they turn into these really great quality, high quality images and the power of Dolly. We're also starting to learn about some of its limitations. Well, this article is interesting because it takes a slightly different take on this whole image generation problem. And it says, what happens when we start to manipulate the inputs of that image generation with an understanding of how the machine learning system is generating the images? So let me be quite frank with you, a little bit transparent, if you will. I'm not totally sure what's going on here, but what I do know is that because these image generation systems use are what use a use a part of a, a layer of them that are called embeddings you're able to do things with embeddings like pass negative embeddings in order to generate the opposite of certain things this happens all the time uh, in embedded natural language processing models like word to vec or BERT models so I think there's something like that happening here the example they provide is that they passed a prompt that was Marlon Brando minus one, suggesting I want an image that is the opposite of Marlon Brando. I'd really be fascinated to, her, to, to learn more and hear more about your interpretation or explanation of what might be going on here. What I don't know is what system they use to actually generate this creepy image of Loeb. The Twitter feed does go through a lot of detail on how they got here. So you do learn a little bit about how their system might fundamentally work under the covers. But at the end of the day, we don't know if it was Dolly that created these or if it was some other custom system that these researchers made. And that's sort of a problem. Nevertheless, understanding how these prompts are creating these images are starting to open up how we're understanding the way in which these images are actually encoding information. So I would highly encourage you to help inform and educate me on how you think these types of things are happening in these very complex generational systems that are becoming all the rage in artificial intelligence. And so with that, I leave you with this. Don't just be data driven, be data science driven. Tune in next week for another episode of This Week in AI, and I hope that you enjoyed what you've had to learn today. Have a wonderful weekend, and I'll talk to you all next week. Bye, everybody.